I'm just going to go over all the questions on exam two. And uh, again, if you have any questions as I'm doing this, then please uh, just interrupt and ask me. So, in problem one, we have the symmetric group S4. And in that group, we have the permutation X, which is the three cycle, one, three, four, and Y, which is the two cycle or transposition, two, three. So part A is just to compute some permutations, X inverse. So X sends one to three, three to four and four to one. So in the inverse, if four goes to one, one will go to four. Three goes to four, so in the inverse, four will go to three. One goes to three, so in the inverse, three goes back to one. So X inverse is just this three cycle, which you can write in, of course, uh, a number of different ways, but they're all the same. Four goes to three goes to one, three goes to one goes to four. These are all exactly the same and they're all correct. Y inverse, two goes to three, three goes to two. So in the inverse, three goes to two, two goes to three or two goes to three, three goes to two. The inverse of a transposition is always itself. So this is X inverse, this is Y inverse. What is X, Y? So a lot of people got this wrong, but this is just the completely fundamental thing of how you multiply permutations. So X is one, three, four, and Y is two, three. So if we write this in standard form, these are functions. Functions operate from right to left. So this function sends one to one, and this sends one to three, so one ends up at three. This function sends two to three, and then three to four, so two ends up at four. This sends three to two, this sends two to two, so three ends up at two. This sends four to four, and then four to one. So this is the permutation x, y. If you write this as a cycle, one goes to three, three goes to two, two goes to four, and four goes back to one. So that is X, Y. It's one, three, two, four. It's a four cycle. And X, Y inverse, you can just write it in the reverse order if you like, four, two, three, one. Or if you like to start with one as I do, one, goes to four to three to one. So one, four, two, three. Okay. So this is the starting point and anything else is going to have to work out. In part B, we want to show that X, Y inverse is equal to Y inverse X inverse. So by calculation. So, so the proof, Y inverse X inverse Here's Y inverse. Here's X inverse. If we write this again in standard form, one goes to four, goes to four, two goes to two, goes to three, three goes to one, goes to one, four goes to three, goes to two. Or if we write it as a cycle, one goes to four, 
four goes to two, two goes to three, three goes to one. And that's exactly x, y inverse. Suppose you multiply in the opposite order. Instead of y inverse, x inverse, x inverse, y, y inverse. So x inverse is 3, 1, 4. y inverse is 2, 3. You write this as a permutation in standard form. One goes to one goes to four. Two goes to three goes to one. Three goes to two goes to two. Four goes to four goes to three. Or as a cycle, one goes to four. Four goes to three. Three goes to two. Two goes back to one. And you see that these are different. Y inverse X inverse is one, four, two, three, which is different from one, four, three, two. So Y inverse X inverse is not equal to X inverse Y inverse. Any questions about that? Right. Professor? Yeah. All right. Could you just, um, I, I get a little confused when it's in like transpose um, thing. Could you go over how to read it again? Really quick? All right. How to do what? All right. So you see um, part B? Yeah. All right. Could you just show me how to um, read the two, three, three, one, four, in what order? Well, so <clears throat> think of it as in calculus. In calculus, if you had a function f of t and a function g of t, you have the composite function. <coughs> f composed with g of t which means f of g of t, right? This is calculus or pre-calculus or anything. This is just composition of functions. So if you're interested in what? Uh, this one, two, three, three, one, four? Yeah. Okay. So suppose f of t is the function 2, 3, and g of t is the function 3, 1, 4. So, so these are functions, right? This is, I mean, you can think of, this is a function that sends 1 to 1, or let's write it in the standard form if you like. This function sends 1 to 1, 2 to 3, 3 to 2, and 4 to 4. That's the function f of t. And g of t is the function. It sends 1 to 4, 4 to 3, uh, 3 to 1, and 2 to 2. So when you write 2, 3, 3, 1, 4, this is just like f composed with g of t, which is f of g of t. So as a function, you could think of this as this composed with this at t is 2, 3 applied to 3, 1, 4 of t. I mean, that's you never write this because it's too complicated, but it's just composition of functions. So what is 2, 3, 3, 1, 4? Suppose I wanted to write that in standard form. So this is you apply this function to one, one goes to four. This function then is applied to four, four goes to four, so one ends up at four. All right. So you want this is like two, three, three, one, four applied to the number one. So that's like two, three of 
314 of 1. This sends, this is a function that sends 1 to 4. So this is 2, 3 applied to 4. This sends 4 to 4. It's just, it's just composition of functions. You read from right to left. You don't read from left to right. So if you just think of these as functions, in, in Math 175, in first semester calculus, you learned the chain rule to differentiate a composite of two functions, and but you knew what comp composition of functions was, right? I mean, you knew that if you had um, f of t is the square root of t and g of t was sine of t, then f composed with g of t is f of g of t, that's the square root of the sine of t. And g composed with f of t would be g of f of t, which would be the sine of the square root of t, right? These, they are, they're different functions when you compose in different orders, but you always compose, you act like the g composed with f of t is g of f of t. It's just, that's what it is. Do I need to explain this more? It's just, you have to just do a lot of examples and no, this makes a bit more sense now that you broke it down. Mm -hmm. Problem two, G is just an arbitrary group. And if you take X, Y times Y inverse X inverse, by associativity, this is the same as x times y, y inverse, x inverse, which is x, e, x inverse, which is x, x inverse, which is the identity. And then you could do the same thing if you like in the opposite order, y inverse, x inverse times x, y is y inverse, x inverse, x, y is y inverse e y is y inverse y is e. So if you take x y and multiply it on the left or on the right by y inverse x inverse. Right. Just one second, please. Sorry, um, yeah, you get the identity. So the inverse of x, y is y inverse x inverse. And of course, if g is abelian, then y inverse x inverse is x inverse y inverse. I mean, that's kind of a trivial statement. And part C is to show that this, this relationship holds for all X and Y, if and only if G is abelian. Well, right here is the proof if G is abelian, this is true. So suppose X, Y inverse equals X inverse Y inverse for all X, Y and G. But we also know that x, y inverse is always equal to y inverse x inverse. So therefore, y inverse x inverse equals x inverse y inverse. And if you want, you can disentangle this. Uh, for example, you could um, multiply on the left and the right by y. You could take y inverse x inverse equals x inverse y inverse and multiply both on the left by y and both on the right by y. So here, y, y inverse, that's just the identity. 
this is x inverse y. This is the identity. This is y x inverse. And then you can multiply again on the left and the right by x. So I multiply by x on the left. I multiply by x on the right. Here I get x y. Here I get y x. So x y equals y x for all x and y. So G is an abelian group. Professor, could you explain uh, the part C again? Explain part C again? So is that what you asked? Yes. Oh, okay. So, so in part C, you have to show that if, if the inverse of x, y it's x inverse y inverse for all x and y, then the group is abelian. So suppose this is true, but we also know this is true, right? We know this is true for all groups. So the inverse of x, y is always y inverse x inverse. And we're assuming that in our group, this particular group, it also is X inverse, Y inverse. So the inverse of an element is unique. So these two have to be the same. Y inverse, X inverse is X inverse, Y inverse, right? And uh, what I'm doing, I mean, there are many ways to do this. Um, to disentangle this, I, Here I have y inverse x inverse equals x inverse y inverse. And I multiply on the left by y. I'm allowed to do that. I multiply on the right by y. And then notice here, y, y inverse is the identity. So this left-hand side is just x inverse y. Here again, y inverse y is the identity. So the right-hand side is y, x inverse. So I have this equals this. And now again, I'm, I'm multiplying these on the left by x and on the right by x. And I have cancellation. And I get yx equals xy for all x and y. And that's the definition of an abelian group. Okay. Any other questions about that? All right. Problem three is to prove Lagrange's theorem. You don't prove Lagrange's theorem by using Lagrange's theorem, you have to prove it. So in this case, G is a finite group. H 
is a subgroup of G. And you have to know what is a left coset. So let A be any element of G. We have the left coset AH, which is A times X, the set for all X and H. And I'm going to prove several statements. The first statement is the left cosets are pairwise disjoint. That means that if two left cosets, AH and BH, have at least one element in common, then in fact, they're the same. So the proof goes as follows. Suppose there's some element Y in AH intersect BH. So Y is in AH. So Y is equal to A times H for some H in the subgroup. Call it H1. And Y is in BH. So y equals b h2 for some h2 in the subgroup. So therefore, b h2, which is y, is a h1. And if I multiply by h2 inverse, b is equal to a h1 h2 inverse. So if you have two cosets, AH and BH, which have even one element Y in common, then you can write B as A times something in H. So for all H in the subgroup H, B times H is A H1 H2 inverse times H. This is an element of H in the subgroup H so this is in this left coset. For all H. So therefore BH, the left coset is contained in AH. And you have a symmetric argument. If you took this equation and solved for A instead of for B, so by kind of symmetry in this argument, AH is contained in BH also. So AH equals BH. So this is a fundamental argument in algebra. If you have two left cosets of a subgroup, they're either, they either have no elements in common or they're exactly equal. So this is the fundamental first step. So suppose that A1H, A2H, a three H and so forth up to A sub K H are the distinct left cosets of H and G. That is the number of left cosets, which is what we call the index of H and G is equal to K. And
every element X in G is in the left coset XH. So every element of G is in a unique left coset. That is, if this is the group G, all these different left cosets, we're saying they're K of them. We know the number is finite because the group is finite. The left cosets partition the group. That is, G is the union, I goes from one up to H of these left cosets. And because the left cosets are disjoint, the number of elements in G is the sum of the number of elements in all of the cosets. The question, question. Now, suppose the cardinality of H is equal to D and say H is equal to H1, H2, H3, up to H sub D, that set of elements. Then the coset AH you multiply everything on the left by A, AH1, AH2 up to AH sub D. And these elements are distinct. So the cardinality of AH, that coset, is the same as the cardinality of H, which is D for every coset. So each of these numbers is equal to D. So the cardinality of G is D plus D plus D K type. That is D times K. Suppose the cardinality of G is N, then The cardinality of G mod H that's equal to K is N over D. That is the order of G divided by the order of H. So this is the proof of Lagrange's theorem. And, um, we've gone over it many times and in the notes and elsewhere. And this is one proof that you're supposed to walk away from math 314 knowing. Okay. Questions about this? Okay. Problem four, so we study cyclic groups a lot. They're very important. Gamma eight is the cyclic group of order eight generated by some element A. So it's E, A, A squared, all the powers of A up to A to the seventh, and A to the eighth is the identity. So the subgroup generated by A to the fourth, this is all the powers of A to the fourth. A to the fourth, A to the eighth, that is A to the fourth squared, A to the fourth cubed, A to the fourth to the fourth, and so on forever. And also A to the fourth to the zero, A to the fourth to the minus one, A to the fourth to the minus two, and so on. It looks like an infinite sequence, but of course, 
a to the fourth squared, that's a to the eighth, is that's the identity. And a to the fourth cubed is a to the twelfth, which is a to the eight plus four, because eight plus four is twelve. That's a to the eighth times a to the fourth. A to the eighth is the identity. So it's just a to the fourth. I mean, a to the fourth inverse, the inverse of a to the fourth is a to the fourth, and so on. So this whole sequence, it really just consists of two elements. So the subgroup generated by a to the fourth is just the identity in a to the fourth. That's the subgroup. And the order of this group is two. Questions about that part? What's the subgroup generated by a to the sixth? It's the set of all powers of a to the sixth. All integer powers of a to the sixth, that is a to the sixth k. k equals zero, plus or minus one, plus or minus two, and so forth. So let's start to look at these powers. A to the sixth to the first power is a to the sixth. A to the sixth squared is a to the twelfth. That's a to the eight plus four. A to the eighth is the identity. That's a to the fourth. Professor, I have a question. Yes. When you write like uh, uh, eight four to the power minus one, you say um, supposed to be equal to a to the four. For the letter A, yeah, that one. Okay, so A to the fourth times A to the fourth is A to the eighth, which is the identity. Yeah. Therefore, the inverse of A to the fourth is A to the fourth. This is the oh, inverse of A okay, to the fourth. Okay, I see now. Right. So this is A to the sixth, A to the sixth squared. What's a to the six cubed? That's a to the 18th. 18 is 16 plus two, right? This is a to the eight times two plus two. So that's a to the eighth squared, a squared. This is the identity. So this is just a squared. So a to the first power is a to the sixth. A to the second power is a to the fourth. So a to the sixth to the second power is a to the fourth. A to the sixth cubed is a squared. A to the sixth to the fourth power, that's a to the 24. 24 is eight times three. So that's a to the eighth cubed, which is the identity cubed or the identity. And then it just repeats from there on. So the subgroup generated by a to the sixth consists of a to the sixth, a to the fourth, a squared and the identity. It doesn't matter what order you write it in. And this is a subgroup with four elements. Great. If you took a to the sixth inverse, that's a squared. Because a to the sixth times a squared is a to the eighth is the identity. So the inverse of a to the sixth is a squared. And if we're looking at the cyclic group gamma eight, this has order eight. If H
is a subgroup of gamma eight of order, let's say D, then D has to divide eight by Lagrange's theorem. Three does not divide eight. Therefore, gamma eight contains no subgroup of order three. Professor, could you go back uh, to the last page? Uh, I would like to ask you a question. You mean to the previous part of the problem? Yeah, the previous one, yeah. Okay. It is a six. Oh, I see. It's so good. Okay. Problem five. We take a cyclic group of order six. And we take the set H consisting of three elements, E, A squared, and A to the fourth. And show this as a subgroup. Well, you can do this in many different ways. For example, you can just write down the multiplication table. So a squared times a squared is a to the fourth. A squared times a to the fourth is a to the sixth, which is the identity. A fourth times a squared is a to the sixth, which is the identity. And a fourth times a fourth is a to the eight, which is a squared. So this is the multiplication table. And you see, first of all, it contains the identity. It's closed under multiplication. And it contains the inverse of each of its elements. The inverse of a squared is a to the fourth. The inverse of a fourth is a squared. So this shows that H is a subgroup. Contains the identity, it's closed under multiplication, contains the inverse of each of its elements. Now you can notice <coughs> the order of gamma six, that's the number of elements, is six. And the order of H is three. So the index of G and H is going to be six divided by three or two. So there are only going to be two left cosets. This is just Lagrange's theorem. And so we have H is e a squared a to the fourth. If I take the left coset a h, multiply everything by a, I get a a cubed a to the fifth. And you see that h together with a h is the whole group gamma six and g mod h consists of just two cosets h and a h.
And what is the multiplication table? H, A, H, H, A, H. H times H is H. H times A, H is A, H. A, H times H is H, is A, H. What is A, H times A, H? That's A squared H. A squared is in this coset, so this is just equal to H. So that's the multiplication table. It's the multiplication table of a group with two elements. Okay. But sir. Question? Yeah, for the left coset, why did you use A? I didn't have to use A. I could have used A cubed. A cubed would still be A cubed, A to the fifth, A to the seventh, which is A, is the same as AH. And a to the fifth h is equal to ah. So when we're looking at the left cosets of h, we have h, which is the same as a squared h and is the same as a fourth h. These are all exactly the same set. And ah and a cubed h and a to the fifth h, these are also the same. So I could have, I could have, I chose h because it's simpler to write. But I could have chosen either of these two, and I could have chosen any of these three. Right? These are the same cosets. They're exactly equal. Right? So these are sets of elements. Other questions? Right. Problem six was to make sure you can write down the definition of a homomorphism. A function G from one group to another is a homomorphism. If F of X, Y is f of x times f of y for all x and y in the group. If you take the element e, the identity, e is the same as e times e. So f of e is f of e times e is f of e times f of e. And if I multiply by f of e inverse, that's f of e inverse f of e times f of e. This is just the identity in the group G. This is the identity times f of e, which is f of e. So this is a simple proof that a homomorphism sends the identity in G to the identity in G prime. And similarly, we have for any x, x times x inverse is the identity. So f of e is f of x, x inverse. So these are the same element. Of course, f of e is e prime. And because f is a homomorphism, this is f of x times f of x inverse, which means if I multiply f of x inverse, if I multiply f of x by f of x inverse, I get the identity. So the inverse of f of x is f of x inverse.
Okay. Problem seven. We take the cyclic group of order 12 and the function from this group to itself defined by f of x is equal to x cubed. So f of x y is x y cubed. This means x y times x y times x y. But cyclic groups are abelian. So this is x x x y y y or x cubed y cubed or f of x f of y. So f is a homomorphism. So in gamma of 12, this is these powers of A. And if you take any number K, for every integer K by the division algorithm, you can write divide k by 12, you get 12q plus a remainder, where the remainder is between 0 and 11. So a to the k, that's a to the 12q plus r, that's a to the 12q a to the r, this is a to the 12th to the q, a to the r, but a to the 12th is the identity. So this is just a to the r, where r is between 0 and 11. And this is the identity if and only if r is 0. So a to the k is the identity if and only if 12 divides k. Right. That's just a fact about the cyclic group. So let x be equal to a to the k, some element of this group. f of x is x cubed, which is a to the k cubed, or a to the 3k. And when is that equal to the identity? If and only if 12 divides 3k. That means 3k is 12 times some number q, or if I divide by 3, k is 4 times q. So a to the k is in the kernel of f. What is the kernel of f? This is all elements <laughs> a to the k and g, where f of a to the k is the identity. That's the definition of the kernel. And f of a to the k is the identity if and only if 4 divides k. Or a to the k, where 4 divides k. And what are the elements of the group that are a to the k, where 4 divides k? Identity a to the fourth and a to the eighth. These are the only integers less than 12. These are the positive integers less than 12 divisible by four. So these elements are in the kernel. If you just want to double check that they really are in the kernel. If f of x equals x cubed, f of the identity is the identity cubed, which is the identity. 
f of a to the fourth is a to the fourth cubed, which is a to the twelfth, which is the identity. f of a to the eighth is a to the eighth cubed, which is a to the twenty-four. Twenty-four is twelve times two, or a to the twelfth squared, or e squared, or e. Um, so the kernel of f, each of these elements is in the kernel. And the argument I just gave shows you that no other element is in the kernel. Any questions about that? And what is the image of f? This is the set of everything of the form f of x, where x is in the group. That's the set of f of a to the k for all k going from 0 up to 11, which is a to the 3k. k goes from 0 up to 11. What are the different powers of a cubed. So we have a to the three times zero, which is a to the zero is the identity. a to the three times one is a cubed. a to the three times two is a to the sixth. a to the three times three is a to the ninth. a to the three times four is a to the twelfth, and you're back to the identity, and then it just keeps repeating. So the image of F consists of these four elements, E, A cubed, A to the sixth, A to the ninth. So this is the kernel of the homomorphism, and this is the image. Any questions about this? Okay. Then the last problem, problem eight, we have an element A in a group G and the function F from G to D, G is defined by f of x is equal to ax a inverse. So you'll notice that if you take f of x times f of y, that's ax a inverse times a y a inverse, that's ax a inverse a y a inverse. This is just the identity. So this is equal to a x y a inverse, which is exactly f of x y. So f is a homomorphism. Now to show that it's an isomorphism, we have to show us one to one and onto. So if we have two elements in the group x and y and f of x equals f of y, then 
AXA inverse equals AYA inverse. If I multiply on the left by A inverse and on the right by A, these are the identity, they cancel and we get X equals Y. So therefore F is one to one. We also want to show that F is on to. <coughs> so so let Y be in the group, or let, um, let X be in the group, must find a Y in the group such that X is equal to F of Y. That is, every element in the group is in the image of F. But of course, F of Y is A Y A inverse. And if you have this equation, you can solve for Y. Y is going to be A inverse X A. And then you can check F of Y which is F of A inverse XA is multiply on the left by A and on the right by A inverse and the AA inverses cancel and you get X. So therefore F is on to, so F is an isomorphism. <clears throat> and what is the inverse of F? This is just like in calculus where you studied functions and their inverses. The inverse of F is a function G from the group to itself such that F composed with G and G composed with F are both the identity function. That is F composed with G of X and G composed with F of X is equal to X for all X in the group. And then we G is what we call the inverse function. So, So X is equal to F composed with G of X. Again, composition of functions. This means F of G of X. And F of G of X, F of any element is A, G of X, A inverse. So G of X satisfies this relation. Solve for G of X. G of X is A inverse X A. So you need to check this as a homomorphism and let's just do our two calculations. What is F composed with G of X? That's F of G of X. G of X is A inverse X A. F of that is A, A inverse X A times A inverse. That's X because these cancel. What is G composed with F of X? That's G of F of X. That's G of AXA inverse. G is this function. 
So that's A inverse, AX, A inverse, A. These cancel, we get X. So done. F inverse of X is A inverse XA. So that's the inverse function. Questions about anything on the exam? <clears throat> okay, then we're done. Last class is on Monday morning. And the exam is a week from Monday, the 24th. Yes, sir. Um, are we going to have another homework or are we done with the homework? Yes, there'll be one more homework, which will be like a review set for the for the exam. And I'll send that out either today or tomorrow morning. All right, anything else? All right, then we're done. See you on Monday, all. Have a good weekend. You too, thank you. Bye. All right, take care, Professor.